Well, it's 10 minutes beyond Berkeley time, so I think it's completely legitimate for us to start. It's a Thursday morning, there are lots of classes going on, and I suspect we'll gain our audience with time. Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this conference entitled uh, Spaces of Liberation. Um, this is, in fact, a conference uh, that is a joint effort between the Center for Middle Eastern Studies here at Berkeley and our partners at uh, Queen's University in Belfast, Northern Ireland. The idea behind this symposium was born out of discussions I had in May of 2012 uh, with Professor Mohammed Gamal Abdel Menam uh, at uh, Queen's following a conference held in Belfast on cities, religion, and violence, of which, in fact, our opening speaker uh, was also present. Uh, we felt that these processes uh, have to be better uh, investigated instead of just simply having case studies from different parts of the world uh, and attempting to relate them to even bigger themes like religion or violence, if you will. This one-day symposium is only a very preliminary attempt uh, at this effort. Hence, the participants of this symposium, scholars of various disciplines, from architecture to history, from planning to political science, will attempt to examine the pace by which public spaces were reshaped and reproduced as spaces of resistance and liberation from traditional uh, state-driven forms uh, of power and control. Uh, where did it all start? Why is it that suddenly we're speaking about spaces of liberation? We weren't doing that in 2001. We weren't doing 2003. We were not doing it in 2007. Perhaps no one could have predicted that the self-emulation of a small-time vendor by the name of Mohammed Barzizi uh, in front of a local municipal office protesting his treatment by a policewoman uh, in the extremely insignificant city of Sidi Bouzaid uh, in Tunisia would have sparked the Tunisian revolution that overthrew Ben Ali uh, at the end of uh, 2010 um, and later, as you all know, spread to places like Egypt, Yemen, Libya, Bahrain, Syria literally in a span of three or four months and ultimately, of course, uh, also brought about uh, other protest movements around the world, uh, including the Occupy movement uh, in both the United States and in Europe. The upheaval in Tunisia and the repercussions particularly of it later in Egypt, uh, as I was uh, saying last week, in fact, in a similar activity held by the College of Environmental Design, um, I, I think Egyptians uh, being the most uh, uh, populous country, Egypt being the most populous country in, in the Arab world, Egyptians must have felt very embarrassed that the Tunisians, uh, whom they usually describe as a country that can fit in one neighborhood in Cairo, uh, managed to remove Ben Ali while they have not been able to do so with Mubarak for almost 30 years. So of course, as we all know, it didn't take more than 18 days in Tahrir Square for Mubarak to be removed from power uh, in February of 2011. The emergence of Tahrir Square as a focal point for this demonstration is a testament to how place and history come together in unexpected ways. Uh, images of the square uh, were extensively aired uh, and broadcast uh, all over the world, uh, you know, from CNN to BBC to local channels, and have been engraved in the minds of people uh, in a way that uh, I personally, as someone who is an urban historian, have never seen before uh, with a space that comes from the Middle East. In fact, suddenly everybody knows Tahrir Square, everybody knows what Tahrir means. Um, and, and in a sense, uh, this brought the Middle East uh, to the fore of discussions uh, about uh, democracy. The role of cities in fostering social and political change, both at a national and a transnational scale, has long been a concern for social theorists, and I would argue also for some people who are involved in uh, the study of architecture and planning. Over the past two decades, scholars have become particularly interested in ways in which the urban condition influences um, contentious politics, social grievances, and insurgencies. In this regard, new spatial arrangements articulated during the uprisings uh, of the Arab Spring have reignited uh, interest uh, again in what Manuel Castells called the urban question, uh, as he envisioned it almost 35 years ago, and underscores the need for new urban qualities. Um, and in this symposium, I think some participants will discuss how diverse insurgent networks, both physical and virtual, are formed in cities and how an appreciation of these networks can contribute to uh, new understanding of urban movements, urban social movements specifically. 
As the art historian William J.T. Mitchell wrote in the aftermath of the Arab Spring, revolutions have always been framed, not only in terms of radically new turns in history, but also in images of return and the cycle of seasons. And I, I actually think that it's very prescient that he used the term cycle of seasons. Today, I never talk about the Arab Spring anymore. I talk, unfortunately, about the Arab winter. So what will come after that, we will see. To ground these uprisings, which actually spread from square to square, uh, city to city, uh, all over the Arab world, it is necessary both to deconstruct the symbolic significance of the spaces where they unfolded and map out the local geographies of protest. Inherent to each of these spaces is a particular urban history or societal geography that allows better understanding of the events that occurred in it. And of course, there are major differences between uh, these spaces and how, in fact, the protest occurred in these spaces. So for example, the revolution, in quotes, that toppled Ben Ali in Tunis did not really happen in the old Medina. The old Medina in Tunis, which has always been the hotbed and the hub of political and of religious activism. Instead, it actually took place on Bulkiba Avenue, a grand boulevard that extends from the old Medina going out, in fact, built during the time of the French. Uh, again, very prescient that it's what the colonists or colonizers actually did that becomes, if you will, the space of protest against the indigenous uh, native. Its spaces, in fact, um, of the Bokiba Avenue were occupied by the thousands of protesters as organizers gave speeches from the windows of its silky white buildings with their colonial history. One reason it became such a focal space was that uh, the numerous uh, streets that lead to, in, to it made it almost impossible for the security forces to prevent the crowds from flooding it. Something similar happened also in Tahrir Square in Egypt, which is not really one square, but, but several spaces connected together and a major hub, a traffic hub as well. Um, in fact, again, that's a square that is totally surrounded by buildings that represent, uh, if anything, uh, Egypt's secular history. Egypt's history since the 1940s and 50s, uh, even though it's a square that is 120 years old, uh, that is what it represented, and not necessarily uh, the, the Islamist inclinations, if you will, of the Muslim Brotherhood who took over the country uh, uh, when the elections happened in 2012. In Sana'a, in Yemen, the demonstrations also started in a square called Tahrir Square, which is very interesting and very important uh, to realize. And again, there's a very specific history here because Yemen was not necessarily a republic. A civil war occurred in Yemen in which Egypt took one side supporting its establishment as a republic. Saudi Arabia took the other side, wanting to keep it as an imamate. Ultimately, the republicans won, and they decided to call the square in Sana'a, Tahrir Square, following uh, Egypt's Tahrir Square in Cairo. Ultimately, it became one of the places in which the so-called Yemeni uh, revolution happened. While each of these protest movements should be analyzed primarily according to its local and national specificities, the ripple effect that tied the countries of the Arab Spring together and the importance of social media in enabling it uh, cannot be dismissed. I would even argue it is one of the most important things and I think we may hear about it from some of the speakers later today. Likewise, over the course of the last uh, uh, you know, two and a half years or so since the uprising started, a diverse body of literature has actually emerged attempting to explain the spread of the uprisings uh, their failures and their successes, and interpreting the socio, uh, socio-political and economic circumstances of the uprising, however, requires uh, us to engage with theories of authoritarianism, theories of secularism, fundamentalism, and democracy. Uh, this diverse body of scholarly work uh, on the praxis of neoliberalism and uh, globalization in the region is also, uh, I think, very relevant uh, to understand the larger context in which the uprisings occurred. While a few studies discuss urban spaces of the uprisings, most, scholars work, most, most of the work of scholars have uh, aimed to illustrate how the uprisings resulted from the new power of social media. Uh, still, I would say this is a very nascent field. Little in-depth work has been done uh, in this arena. But I think it, to understand the uprisings, it is necessary to analyze how insurgent networks 
were formed both in social media and in cities and analyzed the role played by the mainstream media and its coverage of these uh, ensuing events. Uh, it is in these circuits that the mutually constitutive relationship between these essential realms, I would argue, uh, can be discovered. Manuel Castells gave a talk here at the Department of Sociology not too long ago, just on Monday, on his latest book, which is actually called Networks of Outrage and Hope, very properly titled, uh, which actually had more of a focus on precisely this issue that I raised. The Arab uprisings may suggest that social movements have gone through a very distinct change and now involve uh, a new repertoire that is radically changing the mechanisms of contentious performances, uh, a term that was invented by Charles Tilley. The events of 2011 and what followed from them have both altered and added new types of performances to the old repertoire of social movements that was always based on demonstrations, rallies, and public meetings. Uh, the new multifaceted repertoire now clearly evident in the relationship between social media, urban space, and media coverage, particularly as we've seen it in the Arab Spring. As many rallies, uh, at many rallies, protesters uh, could be seen, in fact, holding smartphones on one hand and anti-state banners in the other. And from the tents in occupied squares, internet users disseminated images and messages of the protest through social media. Um, later, of course, much of what they uh, managed to send out to the rest of the world to, to the rest of the world was broadcast through regular media, whether it was in fact national or international, whether it was in fact uh, something that was uh, you know done uh, if you will uh, by BBC or by CNN or by uh, any of the others um, as the protest expanded, claims made by social media and enacted in the physical space of one city could generate a model of protest uh, and be totally reenacted in another city altogether. This cycle allowed for the emergence of what I would call collective enactment that expanded the ever larger numbers of people, culminating, of course, in the more recent protests that we've just seen this past summer in Greece, in Brazil, uh, and in Turkey. Instead, by providing spaces for the reenactment of protests uh, in cities uh, as different as Alexandria and Sanaa, uh, Cairo and Tripoli, uh, these activities played a very decisive role in the shaping of the events themselves. Similarly put, neither the regimes nor the traditional mainstream media nor the rest of the world, I would argue, would have paid any attention whatsoever to the protesters, because a lot of these protests had actually happened in many of these countries and many of these cities before. But because there was no social media at that time, or because it, of its limited use, or because the social media did not manage to penetrate into national and international media, many of these uprisings, small uprisings, never went anywhere. I think there's also a need to look at the new urban dynamic that resulted from this very complex relationship between social, uh, social media and the political sphere. <clears throat> Where now we know that new social media has become a subversive uh, apparatus in the articulation of politics and the reappropriation of urban space. As this repertoire of protest was dramatically and immediately transmitted from one country to another, the urban tactics uh, and the practices used in demonstrations were also at the same time being vividly transnationalized across not only the Arab world but across the larger spectrum of countries that were engaged in these protests. Um, in the end, I think that the use of social media successfully transformed the traditional forms of protests and of claim making among people and increasingly led to the direct political involvement of ordinary individuals, often apolitical citizens, I would even say, in countries where such involvement had rarely existed. One of the most important outcomes of the uprising has not been simply the destruction of the old media regime, I would suggest, but rather the emergence of this new repertoire of mass movements in urban space. To end this, and as a way of also starting our first session, which will have three speakers, each of which will speak about a totally different topic. Um, I think it is important to reflect on the more recent developments that occurred 
particularly this summer. And since my expertise is mainly in the Middle East and mainly in Egypt, uh, that is what I'm going to reflect on for the last uh, five minutes of my talk. More specifically, on what happened between June 30th and July 3rd of 2013 in Cairo and the toppling of Egypt's supposedly first elected president, uh, the Islamist Mohamed Morsi. I think that there are two significant themes that have emerged from uh, these events that are very much relevant to our conference or our symposium called Spaces of Liberation. For me, these are the emergence of new forms of political participation uh, and the bold return of public space to the political arena. On the first, regarding political participation, I would suggest that what happened between June 30th and July 3rd, and I'm very specific here, as a historian, things have a beginning and have an end. And so for me, I'm not talking about the entire protest that actually continues almost until today. But basically, during that time, millions of Egyptians, disheartened with the Muslim Brotherhood uh, and their president, decided to march to ask for the removal uh, of that president uh, in an action that represented a new form of what some people have called street democracy and what I would actually call direct democracy. This new political practice, unfamiliar in the Middle East, is actually not totally new uh, in uh, the context of other countries and in fact is very institutionalized uh, in some countries, including here in our own state in California. We have recall elections. When we dislike a governor, we can easily recall that governor. Uh, very often to our detriment, but we still do that anyway. Uh, we do it through recall petitions and in other countries it's done through referendums. Um, the new form of street democracy, uh, not to be confused with mob rule, I think that's a very important point to make, or the chaos that results from mob rule, poses a challenge, in my mind, to representative and electoral democracy, which we often take for granted. We assume that basically that's the way it is, this is what should continue to happen. Again, as I said last week, uh, in this other symposium we had in my college, the Egyptian people simply decided not to play by the rule book established mainly uh, in the West, which defined the codes and the playbook of democracy. Why wait? Why wait for four years if you're unhappy? Who determines the waiting period? Some would argue, of course, that the, um, you know, these kinds of movements, the movement that occurred between the 30th of June and July 3rd, uh, mainly reflected, or what happened in a place like Egypt, reflected the lack of experience with democracy or even a lack of understanding of democracy and its tools by those who participated uh, in uh, you know, the uprising. Others, of course, I would say mainly conspiracy theorists, uh, presented a picture of the masses being completely manipulated by the elements of the former regime or as they called them in Egypt, the Fulul. Uh, yet there was also a third group who suggested that what happened was simply an opportune moment for the military to orchestrate a coup that had some political cover uh, because of the fact that it had this tremendous popular support uh, and hence you know, the army just came back to rule as it has ruled before. All three scenarios are plausible. I seem to uh, you know, side, if you will, with the former as opposed to with the latter two. Whatever it is, it is one of the most significant develops in my, developments in my opinion um, and its effect will be felt not only in Egypt but way beyond Egypt uh, uh, and way beyond the Arab world. On the second outcome, I would also suggest that what happened in Tahrir and later what happened um, in all of the other squares of Cairo during the protests of the 30th of June to July 3rd has pushed the relationship between media uh, and urban space, media with its old and new forms, social and otherwise, has pushed that relationship to a new height. In the end, I think, um, and as I've argued in some of my own work, revolutions never happen in cyberspace. They just don't happen. It's, it's the, the revolution in the, in the digital realm is not a revolution. It's a conversation. And it's a conversation that has uh, potential but does not necessarily result in action. You need space. You need physical space. You need activities. You need gatherings. You need masses. So, you know, I reject the notion that these were Facebook revolutions. Uh, they were, in fact, urban uprisings with all of the messiness, the violence, and the un unpredictability that accompanies uh, these kinds of uprisings. And um, 
what the Cairo experience, I think, clearly shows us is that the real Tahrir Square, with all of its sweat and blood uh, that was spilled into it, and its virtual other, which existed on Facebook and Twitter, um, are two sides uh, of the same coin. Perhaps uh, it is, in fact, the space of the in-between that one can actually call the space of the liberation. This is why we titled the symposium Spaces of Liberation. Thank you very much. Okay, it's, it's my duty also as the chair of this session to introduce our first speaker, uh, Professor Frank Gaffigan. Uh, Frank is professor of spatial planning at Queen's University in Belfast. Prior to his move to Queen's University's Department of Urban and Regional Development uh, in, nine, in 2002, uh, he worked for almost two decades uh, at the University of Ulster, during which time he was co-director of the Urban Institute. Uh, alongside his uh, extensive experience with the community sector, Professor Gaffigan has been a long-standing special advisor to many local governments in the United Kingdom, and the policy impact of, many of, of much of his research uh, in these areas has been significant. He has been a regular visiting fellow at the, Green, uh, at the Great Cities Institute at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Um, he is the author of Planning in Divided Cities, published in 2011, and City Visions, Imagining Place uh, in Franchising People, published in 1999 and many other publications. His paper today is titled The Paradoxes of Planning and Conflict in Divided Cities. Please join me in welcoming Professor Gaffigan. Thank you, and <coughs> thank you for the welcome, and thank you. Great to be here in, in Berkeley. Um, I'm going to talk mainly about some of the general patterns of urban change and conflict in the world and the way in which planning in particular um, tries to intervene in resolving some of these conflicts. I um, <coughs> don't know whether you can see the screen here easily enough, yeah? But <coughs> one of the things that I think we have to appreciate in the contemporary world is that we live in the urban age for the first time in humanity's history, more people now live in cities than in rural settlement. And just as the global is becoming urban, the urban is becoming global. And um, many cities that were previously homogeneous are now finding great mixtures of population and dealing with diversity and difference for the first time. And of course, the history of trying to deal with immigration is not necessarily an easy one and uh, we find that in many parts of Europe in particular which were previously homogeneous there is a whole issue going on in the politics at the moment a resurgence of the populist right in response and reaction to this diversity brought about by immigration and I think what we have to appreciate to begin with then is in this increasingly globalized world, increasingly urbanized world, there are three related problems that we are trying to address. One is how we as people live on the planet, seven billion plus, developing into places like mega cities that we've had no precedence for in human history. How we live as people on this small planet. The second related issue is how we live with the planet. How do we live in terms of a balanced ecology? How do we deal with rising problems like climate change, etc.? But the third problem, and the one that we're associated with today, is how do we live with each other on the planet? That if we are becoming more and more like a global village, not that with the death of distance that we're having the end of geography, not that we're living in some kind of borderless world. In fact, if anything, the sense of territory and the link between territory and identity is getting much closer. But how do we live on this small planet with each other where we have to confront the other, the stranger, in a way that previously was not the case? Now, I think the, <coughs> the answer to that is often in many countries dealt with through new policies like multiculturalism. <coughs> 
And multiculturalism has had a pretty poor record of trying to deal with difference. And part of our discussion later on might be the virtues and problems of multiculturalism relative to other approaches like cosmopolitanism. But there is basically a problem of sustainability here in dealing with difference in the world. And there's a problem of what has come to be known in the literature in recent times, one of urban resilience in particular. And this concept of resilience can be understood in two main ways. One is an understanding which is about how can cities recover from shocks? How can a Cairo recover from the shock of the urban unrest? And the assumption in that idea of resilience is how can it get back to what it was? How can it get back to stability? But a different concept of resilience, and I think one that we're more concerned with here, is a concept which says we don't necessarily want, after a shock, to get back to where we were. We don't want to get back to a status quo. We want to get back to something different that gives us a better scope for real urban resilience in the longer term. Now, <clears throat> the other thing I think to keep in mind is that it is intrinsic to the human condition to be in conflict. There isn't some kind of natural lost paradise where people lived in some glorious harmony with each other. It is part of the human condition to be in conflict. And even in Belfast, where I'm from, where we had 40 years of what euphemistically was known as the Troubles, describing the violent conflict of the last four decades as the Troubles, nowadays it's assumed that some people are troubled by not having that violent conflict. Um, so how we deal with conflict as something that is natural and intrinsic rather than something that is an aberration is, is very significant. And of course, where we're focused in largely in the next few days, the Middle East is a cauldron of that conflict for many, many decades. Um, <clears throat> and central to the conflict there is the one between Israel and Palestine. And the impasse that comes from that conflict um, the balance between the violence on the one hand and the sense of the need for security and establishing a legitimacy for both the main protagonists and so on in that part of the world has been one of the central features of urban conflict in the modern world. But one of the things that you notice very much <coughs> when conflict leads into violence is how it produces the need for security and segregation. This is Baghdad before the invasion. And as you can see here, in terms of areas that were Shia majority in green, or the areas that were Sunni majority in red, there was a good scattering across the city. And uh, the blue areas, small blue areas, um, are not even visible in that map, which is where the Christians were well integrated into every other part. But the orange areas were the mixed areas where populations lived very closely together. But after the invasion, here's what you end up with. You end up with large degrees of segregation, almost the river Euphrates being the dividing line. And where the Christians, for example, in blue, then do start to congregate together in the need for some kind of security. Um, so Conflict that leads to violence leads often to that kind of urban segregation which leads then to further ideas of insecurity and violence. Now that's where I think we need to distinguish two main types of urban conflict. One I would call conflict around issues of pluralism, issues about class or race or gender what you might call the fairly ordinary and common features of conflict in cities. And if you take a city like Chicago, for example, um, here's the gleaming towers of downtown Chicago. Um, and if you visited Chicago in recent times, relative to many other cities in the Midwest, it has managed to be sustainable and resilient in the face of a large experience of deindustrialization and economic change. But if you go just shortly away from the city center to the south side, 
Lone Lake. You come to Southside Chicago, which is the home of the seminal ghetto in Chicago. It's the area of spatial concentration of African Americans in the city. And that's a very different kind of city. And so what we understand very much in the case of American cities in particular is the way in which race has been a major fault line of division and conflict and inequality. It has been separate development, but separate and unequal development uh, in that way. And you see the spatial reflection of that in many American cities where you get the concentration, particularly of African-American and Hispanic groups, away from often the mainstream opportunities in the city. And of course, that produces its own insecurity in the city as a whole. And it produces the kind of surveillance city that we're increasingly seeing as a way of dealing with that. Now, that's one type of urban conflict. It's a very common conflict around the inequalities in relation to class or race or whatever. A very different kind of conflict is that which is concerned with sovereignty, um, where it's not just an issue of whose city, but whose country. The city, in this case Jerusalem, becomes a microcosm for the greater degree of conflict and division in that part of the Middle East. And each of the main protagonists brings to Jerusalem its own sense of history. In the case of the Jewish, it'll be the experience of the Holocaust. In the case of the Palestinian, it'll be in the case of a, being a holy city for the Palestinians. But what's happening in Jerusalem, as you know, with the separation wall, is that there's an attempt to divide the city in a different way and to control the city in a different way, uh, which will come on to. Now that kind of division, that kind of city that is locked into uh, the approach of uh, that kind of conflict is found in many other places. This is Nicosia. This is me standing just over where the United Nations has this buffer zone in the city, separating the Turkish Cypriot from the Greek Cypriot. And so you have a city like Nicosia that is <coughs> divided in this way between the two parts and where in more recent times in Ledra Street, its main kind of arterial route in the city, they've tried at least to open up the city where you can travel from one part to another. But if you're in the Greek Cypriot part of the city and you want to move into the Turkish Cypriot part of the city, you have to go through these kind of borderlines here. You have to show a passport. You have to have a visa to get into the other part of the city. So it'd be like walking down any major city you can understand and coming to a certain point in the road where at the other side is not just a different part of the city, but it's almost a different country. Uh, so these kind of cities that are locked in what you might call sovereignty struggles are different uh, from the kind of cities that are locked in traditional conflicts. Now, I think that in those kind of cities, in cities where the struggle is over the issue of sovereignty, who owns the country, you get four main types of space. You have ethnic space, which is where you get large concentrations of one tribal group or another. You get neutral or secure space, which can sometimes be in the city center areas where there's an attempt at least to have some neutral space. You can have shared space, this relates to Belfast, and in the case, this is our university here, that claims to be shared space, open to both Protestant and Catholic as a place of safe dialogic exchange between the two. And then you can have cosmopolitan space, which transcends the legibility of space in terms of conflict. It tries to be more international in character. Now those four types of space, ethnic, neutral, shared, and cosmopolitan, relate very much to how we can plan in cities that are so deeply divided. Um, <clears throat> and when we try to talk about planning and contested space, there are four main models of planning that we can imagine.
One is the idea of neutral planning. The idea that the planners are above the conflict. They have no relevance, if you like, to the conflict there. They are simply as professional, technical, apolitical people trying to organize urban development and urban space regardless of the conflict. In many ways, in conflict cities, that's not feasible. Planning is about the social ordering of space. Many of these conflicts around the issues of sovereignty are about conflicts of territory, conflicts of space. So planning, whether it likes it or not, is intrinsically involved in the way in which these cities deal with their conflict. Another model of planning in these circumstances is what we might call partisan planning. That's where planning doesn't at all pretend to be neutral, but it adopts the role of one of the protagonists. Many people see planning in Jerusalem in these terms where the planners become an instrument of the Jewish state trying to Judaize Jerusalem in terms of securing its Jewish demography, in terms of the way in which it uses planning instruments to minimize or marginalize the Palestinians, Palestinian opportunity in the city. That's not a neutral way of planning, it's a partisan where planning is directly involved in promoting the interests of one side of the conflict over the other. Another kind of planning um, model in this case is equity planning, where planning says that in this conflict there is inequality. Maybe two or more groups are competent groups in the conflict, but one group is the more subjugated group. And it's the role of planning to try and redress that inequality, to try to compensate in some way for the subjugated or uh, subordinate status of that group relative to the other. <clears throat> and then the fourth model that you can imagine is the resolver model, where planning sees itself not simply as responding to the problem of conflict, but trying to be a key instrument of resolution of the conflict. Now, at the same time, planning doesn't exist in a policy vacuum or a political vacuum. And this is where I think, in policy terms, we have four main types of policy response to cities of deep conflict. One is, you can accept the fact that the conflict is there and is likely to stay there in perpetuity. And what you say is, we have to simply accommodate ourselves to this ever-ending conflict in Jerusalem. And we have to accept the fact that the main protagonists in the conflict are keen from each of their perspectives to promote their own absolutisms, their own exclusivities, and so on. And we have to plan around that. The second approach in policy terms can be to say, yes, we have this divided city. Yes, we have two or more main protagonists, and so on will not really bring them together in any greater degree of integration or harmony. But maybe what we can get them to do is to live and let live. To accept the other. Not to come to love the other, but to accept that the other is there and find a way of organizing the city that allows for that division in the most productive and harmonious way that you can deal with division in that way. The third approach on policy terms is to say that what we really need to do to deal with this conflict is to promote a different kind of politics. A politics which has the capacity for real dialogue across the divide. A politics which recognizes the different identities and different sense of belongings and ownerships and so on that go on. And where instead of saying that we can achieve some kind of consensus across that divide, that we accept that we're going to have to live with a dissensus, a conflict forever, but one in which people can engage with each other across the conflict with mutual respect. And then the fourth and last of the main policy approaches is to say, yes, we have difference. And living with human difference can be an enriching experience. It doesn't have to be a negative one. And if we can promote 
a greater degree of interculturalism, a greater degree of hybridization across culture and so on, um, then that would be the best way for mutual benefit across the divide. Now those four different approaches to dealing with difference and conflict are, I think, where we are in terms of the politics of it. But <clears throat> in terms of planning and <clears throat> how planners try to approach this, even when well-intentioned, planners, I think, face a number of major contradictions in the way that they go about it, a major paradoxes, if you like, in the way in which you plan in divided cities. The first paradox is that <clears throat> planning is an activity which is about order. It's about establishing patterns. It's about predictabilities. It's about rationality. Whereas the conflicts that we're talking about are about emotion, quite often. They're not necessarily reducible to reason. Um, they are about often passions, mayhem, volatilities, uncertainties. And so how planning as a culture used to the notion of order and pattern deals with disorder and the lack of pattern um, is one of the paradoxes that it faces. Another paradox is that planning is about the links between the spatial and the temporal. And if we take a matrix of space and time like this, micro scale meaning around the city level, meso scale city region, macro scale national, international, and dealing with time in terms of the history of it, in terms of the contemporary period, and looking ahead. Now, often in conflict cities, the areas that are deepest in conflict are locked in this part of the matrix. They are communities that are often locked in the past and they're often dealing with very narrow horizons. <clears throat> as you try to bring about some stability in the conflict and as maybe you succeed in reducing some of the violence in the conflict, you might get an opportunity for those same communities to look more towards the future, not always to be hankering back up to the past. But what you really want is to get them moving beyond this micro scale, not just getting moving in terms of their temporal perspective, but also the spatial perspective, that they look beyond their local community and even their local city to looking at a wider sense of the world, a more open and pluralist sense of the world in which their development can, can take place. Now, <clears throat> Another paradox that is, is found very much in these kind of conflicts is that involving the concept of community. Community in a place like Belfast is separated by these kind of walls. They're known or misknown as peace walls. Um, and the various territories within and behind these peace walls are marked by various murals like this that depict one of the protagonists. And often what you get is these no man lands between one side of a community and another side of the community, um, separated by these kind of buffer zones. Now, the idea of community is a fairly positive one. And planners, particularly in the modern world, uh, often would say, we want to work with community. We want to plan at the level of community. We want to decentralize the way we plan to get to that local neighborhood level and to work closely with people in shaping their areas. And you would say, in general terms, that's a very democratic impulse, a very useful decentralizing impulse. But if you try to plan with local communities, small communities, in deeply divided cities, and if you operate at the behest of those local kind of areas, the danger is that you simply reinforce the ghettoization. You simply reproduce that sense of exclusive community. Because while community has a connotation of solidarity, again, you might say in many respects that the collective notion of community is a preferable, more social solidarity one than the idea of individual citizenship. 
But if you take somewhere like Egypt, that has been struggling at the moment to replace autocracy, and there's a real issue out at the moment, is it going to replace it with a theocracy or a democracy? Um, there is a problem of how we define citizenship in these kinds of conflicts. Now, back in Belfast, if I take on the mantle of community and say it is part of my community culture to go out and draw murals which depict aggressive, militaristic antagonism to the other side, then quite often that's permitted as an expression of community culture. Whereas if I, as an individual citizen, took a paintbrush and went out and tried to paint a wall or a curbstone or whatever, I would be very soon arrested and charged with criminal damage. But somehow because I do the first thing at the behest of community and in the name of culture and the name of identity, somehow that's politically acceptable. Whereas if I do it as an individual, it's something very different. And so this issue of whether in conflict zones and conflict cities we need less community and more the idea of individual rights as citizens, uh, where the rule of law, where human rights, where universal principles are upheld, whether that's around issues of gender, whether it's around issues of individual rights, um, is, is very much a key thing. Another paradox or contradiction that planners face is between the development of what might be known as compact urbanism, sustainable urbanism, and the idea of territorial inclusion. In places like Belfast, you get lots of open space that has come about because people have left the area. In the course of the conflict, there has been an exodus of people out of the area for safety. And these open spaces now, what you might call brownfield sites, are being used or being called upon by one side or another and for their particular interest. In this case, these were largely Protestant areas and where Catholics now are saying, we need more housing, here is open land, why can we not have our housing on this land? But if you were to put Catholic housing on this land, the nearby Protestant areas would see this as a territorial incursion, a trespass onto the land that once was theirs. So again, what you might regard as a good thing in normal urban planning, the maximum use of brownfield land as a sustainable way of developing in an urban context. In a situation where there is urban conflict, that spatial redesigning of electoral influence um, in a very sensitive local geopolitics like that is something that will be seen very differently. Another paradox of that kind is between policies that are trying to deal with social inclusion and those policies that are trying to address social cohesion. In Europe, the term social inclusion refers to policies designed to deal with social inequalities, policies designed to deal with poverty, policies trying to include groups that are marginalized. Now, if you try to do that in a very conflict-ridden city, where one of the protagonists tends to be in a less equal position to the other, and you try to address that inequality, from your policies of inclusion, what you may do is cause yourself problems with your policies of cohesion, your policies of trying to bring the two sides together. Because one side will then claim that lot over there are getting more than us. There are more urban resources being devoted to them than to us. And so the difficulty of getting strategies that on the one hand deal with regeneration and at the same time deal with reconciliation in a context of urban inequality rooted in the conflict um, is one which can often just provoke more antagonism. Now, let me just jump a little bit because I know the time is uh, five, minutes, five minutes, yeah, I'll just get to where we want to get to. What I've been trying to say is that when you are planning 
in a divided society. It's not like planning, if you like, in your typical city. The, if you go to a planning conference in somewhere like Los Angeles, even now, decades after this debate, you'll still hear people talking about the urban problem is one of urban sprawl, of trying to get still what is a sustainable, containable city centre and so on. These remain the key aspects of planning debate. But when you are talking about planning in divided cities, in addition to those traditional arguments, there are these extra problems of how you deal with difference. And I suppose it could be summarized in this way, that planning in divided cities can inadvertently accentuate the conflict rather than ameliorate it. It can make the thing worse, even unintentionally, because in adopting the normal things it tries to do, working with communities, trying to maximize brownfield land, whatever, the normal, sustainable, proper things that planners should be trying to do. In a conflict situation, inadvertently, what you may be doing instead is exacerbating the conflict between the two sides. Now, let me end just with this kind of issue. Uh, <clears throat> where do we go if traditional planning is not an instrument that can easily handle deeply conflictive cities. Some people in the planning literature say what we need to get to is collaborative planning. We need to find a way of explaining to the protagonist groups that if each tries to pull against each other, nobody wins. But if we can get them into a more consensual collaborative relationship, even though the conflict itself may remain unchanged between them, but if they can begin to see that across that conflict there is also mutual interest, that we can get some degree of collaboration amongst them that will be more productive for everybody. Now, what I would argue is that however appealing that argument is, it is an argument that is misplaced. It's an argument that believes that conflict is an aberration and that the proper, stable, normal situation is consensus. And it's about saying, how can we as urbanists, planners, architects, whatever else, in these deeply divided places, bring together the various protagonists and try through rationality and argument and all the rest to persuade them of their common interest? I don't think that that's possible, and maybe not even desirable. We're talking about places where the argument of force always trumps the force of argument. And so it is unrealistic to expect that there is some kind of hidden natural consensus just waiting to be exposed through a good rational approach to difference. Instead, I think it is better and more realistic to say we don't live in a rational universe. These kind of conflicts are intrinsic across the world and they're deeply embedded in certain parts of the world. And therefore, what we should be about is not seeking consensus across these divides, but rather seeking for the protagonist to understand, yes, we are divided. Yes, we do have different perspectives on the thing. And this is the difficult and interesting relationship between what I would call the ontology, the epistemology, the ideology and the methodology of how we go forward in all of this. The ontology, that is how we understand social reality, is constructed from our attempts to get epistemology, to get knowledge and command over that reality. But the lens through which we look at that epistemology, the lens through which we look at how we get knowledge, is ideology. We look at it from a certain value system, a certain perspective. And people deeply in conflict with each other have their own ideological perspective, their own construction of social reality, their own sense of what is acceptable knowledge. And they will debate and, and contest any evidence, in commas, which denies that perspective. They will say the methodology is wrong. So even if you, through social scientific methods or whatever, try your best in a dispassionate way to say, look, here's the reality in this situation. Here's this group which is more disadvantaged than the other. Here's this group which is more subjugated or subject to violence or whatever. That evidence 
is not going to be accepted by all contesting sides. That becomes part of the contest. The epistemology and the ontology are deeply part of the contest itself. And therefore, what we really have to try and do is to acknowledge that in a candid way and say, basically, we want a different kind of politics here. And sometimes in the literature, this is increasingly being referred to as agonistic politics. A-G-O-N-I-S-T-I-C, agonistic politics. Meaning that instead of antagonistic politics of conflict, you can maybe get to the point where people can continue to accept that they differ from each other, but that they come to some kind of mutual understanding of that, what the difference is, and they come to some kind of respect for each other that allows you to have a candid, honest exchange of difference. Not a pretend conviviality, not a pretend consensus, not a notion that you can get people in a room and if you don't mention certain things, you can get them to start to agree with each other. Because what we have come through in the last 40 years is exactly that. We have tried to create what sometimes in our jargon is known as a constructive ambiguity. Where you get the protagonists around the table and you try to find these nice warm words that nobody can easily disagree with and you try to get them to sign up behind these words. Do you want to live in a shared society? Well, who is going to say, in most circumstances, no, I don't want to live in a shared society. I want to live in a society where I win. Most people won't say that openly. So it is possible, through what discourse analysis calls empty signifiers, empty words, like shared society, integration, to get all these harmonious, warm words and get people locked behind them. But these unravel very easily if the root of the conflict is not really tackled. Now, just let me finish with illustrating how difficult this is. Um, <clears throat> I've been working for a long time with a whole set of communities in Belfast who differ strongly from each other in the lines that I've been talking about. And they work at the level of neighbourhood, they work in the field of regeneration and development and so on, but they are deeply antagonistic towards each other. And so one of the things that we tried to do was, we tried to see, was it possible to establish a set of principles, abstract, generalised principles, before you get into the nitty-gritty of particular areas and particular disputes, around which you could congregate a level of agreement at least, which would allow people to examine where the disagreements were. And we have ten principles altogether. I'm just giving you these examples of these five, and I don't mean to go through them all individually, but if I could just quickly illustrate how difficult they actually are. If you take the first one, no particular grouping has a right to claim any territory on behalf of a communal identity. All of the city should be considered commonwealth, shared space. Right? Now again, on the face of it, that seems relatively simple and straightforward. And because it contains some of those warm words that I've talked about, shared space and so on, it's very easy to mobilise a certain degree of consent around that. But then when you try to get people to say, okay, you agree with that. Now, do you know that the implication of that is that you cannot stop a march going down this road of a group that you disagree with? Because it isn't your road. You may live here, this may be your community space, but it isn't your city exclusively. And therefore, what we need to have is a freedom, a, a multiplicity, a hybridity in the city, a pluralist city for a pluralist people that is an open city in that way, without spaces being regarded as territorial spaces belonging to one side or the other. Now, once you explain that, and once you deconstruct it in that way, of course, then they step back and say, well, hold on a minute, right? And similarly, as you go down, it gets more difficult as you go down towards the bottom ten, right? But what I'm saying is that unless you engage in these kind of exercises, where it, with the protagonists, you actually expose for them the implication of trying to get a more agreed way forward in a city. 
then you can't easily unravel what some of the difficulties actually are. And from our point of view and the, the work that we do, um, we often say, though we're working from the university and so on, we often say, we don't come into this situation in some way as value neutral. We don't come in to various community groups and so on and say, now what is it you want to do? We are planners and architects and so on, and we can help you translate what you want to do. No, we come in and say, we have values as well. We have values which are about an open city, a pluralist city, a city that has common belonging, a city which elevates the civic over the ethnic in that way. And if you don't agree with some of those basic values, then perhaps our working together is going to be highly problematic. But we don't want to pretend to you that we're coming at some kind of value-neutral approach in this situation. Because in a situation, as I say, where you have this link, this very difficult link between ontology, social reality, epistemology, how we develop knowledge around that social reality, ideology, the lens through which we look at it in constructing it, and the methodology of how we do it. When you have that link you know, amongst those four, then without being candid, without being able to say openly and honestly, here's what the situation is, um, then it's very difficult. Now, you may have noticed in one of the overheads that I had back there, there was a particularly militaristic mural which said, prepared for peace, ready for war. And that belonged to a particular community that we were working with at the time. We brought our postgraduate architecture and planning students into the community to work with the community in helping them move forward in regenerating their area. But <clears throat> one of the things that you found coming into the community was there was a very small gateway into the community where they had a little sign saying, the name of the community was Mount Vernon, sign saying, Mount Vernon welcomes you. And one of the first things I asked the students to do, I said, take a photograph of that, and then take a photograph of that mural. And in the first engagement with the community, we put the two sets of photographs on the table and said, look, you need to make up your mind which of these photographs represents your area. Are you saying that you're an open area, that you're a welcoming area, that you believe in diversity and plurality and so on? Or are you saying, as your mural seems to say, no, we're a partisan community. We welcome people selectively if they belong to our tribe. But be careful if you don't. Which of these two visions for your community do you actually have? And I think that's the kind of question that fundamentally we're at in dealing with these divisions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Mohammed Gamal Abdel Mena. Uh, first of all, I think I must thank Professor Nizar Sayyad for hosting the event and taking the ideas that we discussed back in Belfast forward. And I hope that this event will be a contribution to the vast studies and events and activities of the Center uh, for Middle Eastern <coughs> Studies at the University of Berkeley is just really contributing significantly. We just keep visiting the activities and, and learning from it. So uh, as perhaps for the opening speech of uh, Professor Sayad, just he mentioned about the rule of books, uh, sorry, the book of rules, which the Egyptians just came to this point that to question that and we start to have to re really forge their own way of developing their way to discover their cities. So among the vast research that has been taking place to study this phenomena, the Arab Spring or what's happening in Egypt, I will be trying here to offer a reading, a particular reading based on field work and based on studies that is in fact started before the Arab Spring when I was doing field work to study the old Cairo, the communities and the Hawari of old Cairo and start to understand how do they really work, how do they really act to the events around them. And when the Arab Spring emerged, us, we start to understand that there's some significant implication to the everyday way of living the Kairines or people of Cairo just do and how it came later to impact the events of the revolution and what comes next. 
So in fact, just my focus here will be looking at the, the uprising in Cairo as a social phenomenon that really reflect on spatial implications and development. And that's why I will be really just going for briefly as a start to try to define what we have learned from Cairo, all communities, and how do they really challenge certain systems and structures imposed by the modern city planning, perhaps, or management and politics. So this is picture perhaps just was taken on the first day that on the 25th of January 2011 and captures actually what is the happening here and where the territories happened, where the state stops and where the individuals have right to the city. Who claims the city? Does the city really, as you mentioned, uh, Professor Syed, at the start, is just bring the urban space back to politics and actually back to everyday life that the individuals Individuals start to believe that they have the right to their city and being giving up, giving up that space to the state and its institutions just really came back to haunt them at home. So just we'll really see how the negotiation between these two parts of the, of the uh, city in Cairo and in Egypt really come to conflict. So as a start, just very briefly looking at the way that we live, the kind of structure of society. And for certain several centuries that and part of it was in Cairo in particular that people were really developing their own living style as a kind of evolution phenomena and a kind of uh, coherent communities that come out of their needs out of their responses to each other and communities but in the 20th century we start to become the more structured society where a routine is being developed and this is perhaps part of the anthropologist just problems or difficulties now. That what kind of routine, what kind of habits that we study, if everything around you is restructured, from the apartment, from the daily routine, from the time that you head to work, the transport that you take at certain times, the meals that you take, get back to, to house and your home and so on. Everything is, in fact, is well planned and structured and giving you a little bit of space to just manage your daily needs. But this seems to keep going on for an intensive, routine, so people start to struggle. And if the needs of the individuals are taking place, are being served, so everybody's happy and will fit their place within the city. But when they start to feel the suffering of the <coughs> problem of uh, economic problems, or uh, they have, this is a kind of protest in Rome last year for the, uh, uh, to just asking for free education, then people start to take to the street. So in fact, the, the over-structured system of our, living, of our current contemporary society works when people are happy, but when people start to suffer, they start to negotiate and force their territory back to the city. So in fact, the deterioration of personality and dominance, structured patterns of living style that happen, but at a certain moment that this will have to claim the city back. This is just a further point about if just a, a few reflections on uh, uh, Richard Sennett's just a fall of public man when really you start to feel that you have no personality at all in your own public patterns of life. Even in your office you start to force a sense of privacy. You need to create your own world around you, even on your desk. And by this is a kind of contest here between the city when it even comes to the social housing, you have no choice of where to live or what to do or even touch the finishing of your materials or the, your uh, you are really contained within a cell to live in, in a social housing in Rotterdam. But in fact, so you start to respond by forcing your, your life into a really getting uh, into the public space and start to get your voice heard to challenge the authority of the state. But this happens on a daily basis, in fact. So on every day that you will find that you have a public space, that everyone has to create a sense of privacy. You need to really to develop your own social uh, uh, universe around you, even within a space that's really not planned for doing so, so you can start to get a sense of privacy. If you are taking a meal in a park and somebody just really start to come and, and touch you or just becomes beside you, you start to really question, where is my territory here? And this keeps happening in everyday practice. So in fact, that without really this sense of privacy in the public space, that we will are losing a lot of uh, just personalities and a lot of rights. And we tend to keep 
protecting these kind of rights throughout our day, everyday practice. So we don't tend to really understand how the privacy works because it's just the, st the traditional conventional separation between the public and the private seems to be superficial and, and actually is not in practical. But in fact, based on the studies of everyday practice, you can feel that the privacy appears in the public space and the public sphere, and the public sphere really forces itself sometimes into private arenas. So the territory, territorial uh, behavior just really keeps changing, and as an individual, you tend to develop your own behavior based on the context within which. This will give us just a little bit of clue about what we will be looking at next in Tahrir Square. So in fact, we have the difference between the physical space required for uprising, for revolution to materialize, and between the spatial sequence, between the system that a grand master is doing based on uh, Michel de Certeau's theory of everyday life. Somebody is just planning the city, putting the standards. And the other part of the, of the picture, which is the uh, individuals in their own societies and communities, reproduce that space. So we have a really a contest between the master plan and the evolution plan. Here just give us just an idea about what has been happening in Cairo over a long time and not just only these days. We have perhaps, or perhaps most of you might be familiar with the urban structure of Cairo between the old Cairo, the Islamic Cairo that have developed over centuries. And this part that have evolved from a very single path, which is Shar al Muiz, and is actually the government establishment and around that. And with time, they start to come to different communities and Hawaii, that's really very hard to see it from that scale. But it was homogeneous, it was attending to the needs of their people. By the second part of the 19th century, you start to get a kind of rulers who would like to imitate the European experience and create Paris over the Nile, and they start to abandon this part, do not really, could not really cope with it, and start to create their own system, a structured world, adjusting to an evolutionary world. In fact, this has an implication of the way people behave their rules within the state, within society. From being the center of activities here and trade and economy, they start to become marginalized and those people connected to regimes and rulers, they start to affiliate themselves with a modern phenomenon. And this has been a part of the state strategy since then. This was not even then, it's just it's actually continued until this current day. And you start to have the marginalized ordinary populace of Cairo was really left on the peripheral uh, system of the state and those who are really centered in its institutions. This perhaps created the parallel world that we have. Old Cairo, the everyday practice, the people who really manage their everyday space on their own was that with minimum intervention from the state. And the state who failed really to control what's happening here and found this really hectic and, and problematic, they start to create their own venture of a modern image. So between the formality and the celebrated image of the state and between the marginalized part of the city, which is really made the city work in Cairo, you have these two parallels. And to a certain extent, every part of this picture just to have their own misconception towards the other. So in fact, there has been ongoing practice in which that has two things are happening. There is an ordered state and spaces where people are really more affiliated with the state institution, but there are another war part of the society that really disconnected from all that system. Perhaps later, some groups like the Muslim Brotherhood built on that, but this was a factual thing that's happening. So how these things came together? So again, forcing their spaces, and this is not only exclusive to Egypt or Cairo, this happened elsewhere when people lose the chance to influence politics they will start to come to the street and like, practice the most explicit practice of this is just having a tent and live in the space, whether an Occupy movement or more street movement and so on. So it's effectively the most explicit way to challenge the state is to claim your own physical space within the city and start to manage it and sustain it for a long time. This is, I am here, this is my country, it's not yours. So getting back to Cairo here and then we'll start to focus on this uh, work. So is it a battle about space? Is that only space? Or it is about the freedom, democracy, 
in the country itself, future social justice, equity, and liberation, all of these, what's their relation to the space? In fact, it's just the space in that sense is a sample of where, who belongs to whom, who controls what. And that's why the city of a place like Cairo came all about Tahrir Square for 18 days on the start of the revolution. So it became at the, at what actually forced the whole challenge that, and this remains a question over two and a half years now, and will continue, who claims the territory in Tahrir Square? Who is actually claiming that space, that sample space is actually who says that I'm here, I'm, I'm defending my space within the country. It's just part of the conflict, just very quickly here, that as a structure of Cairo, for those who are not familiar with it, you have a centers of powers, which is looking at the way that the structural uh, development here, that you will have centers of powers where the formal institutions, where economy, where the large capitalist assets are there, surrounding by lower class of just middle class people or and low and lower and lower, because they, they are dependent to each other. And at certain moments where Tahrir Square appears here to be connected to uh, centers of these powers, and actually a lot of state institutions in the vicinity of it. And at one moment, when everybody was submitting to Mubarak regime at that time, and okay, it's not our state, it's their state, the police before was at the service of people, but emerged at that time to, have, to reach to the extreme that it's not your state any longer. Actually, we both are servant for the nation or as a nation service. So we are not even responsible to you. The state and institution that's responsible for people saying that we are not responsible to you. We both serve the nation, which is in fact means their institutions. So people start to give up. As you can see, nobody cleans the street. Just it's, it's all explicit about uh, presenting some one person who really forces it. So if this is the situation, if this is not our country, if this is not our world, how did they really manage their own war? Than or their own lives, their daily, uh, their daily lives. Looking at a small detail here on this kind of old Cairo as an example of May of like 60% of Cairo, which is actually is a, uh, our communities that are not really um, under the direct control of the state because they have their own parallel system of living. They have their own dense living structures, where, pe where houses are actually under direct control of themselves. They don't have a state police to just keep touring the street or just keep uh, patrolling it. It's just they have their own way of controlling the entrances, which has developed over centuries. But they, have, they are also every stranger, including myself, when I was doing the field work there, under direct surveillance from the moment that you get in until you get out. There is a direct collaboration between everyone within this house, just serving each other, getting food to each other, helping each other for medical condition and so on. It has been a kind of a whole system of non-state centered or non service centered kind of, of, uh, of uh, urban phenomena, but it's, a, it's about mutual collaboration towards everyday needs. And this appears in every event, like at difficult times, at even prior times of separation, when they would like even to transport for a wedding. So they start to carry everyone in the community, just go there, carry and support each other, carry part of the new furniture of the, of the wedding, and then take them to the next point. This actually a kind of a detailed uh, narrative of how people, where people are distributed along one of the, uh, of the Hawari of Old Cairo, which actually they start to make, maintain a security system group of people at the entrance, securing who comes in, and people are just really monitoring who are there throughout. Coffee shops at the corners to maintain control and to maintain just really the social patterns of activities. Who is coming in is really under scrutiny. When a, a kind of public event happens, everybody just come and sit in the streets, and effectively they translate, or sorry, they transform that public space into a kind of shared private space and they start to have a party and so on, where it's, it's still, it's a liberal culture, where women and men are all together and in the street for a long time. All the spaces between the different apartments and the street come to merge and everybody has the fluency of coming in and out. So it's not really that radical culture. But when it comes to <coughs> 25th of January, 2011, what happened? What, what, what 
escalated this situation that has been settled for centuries. In fact, is actually part of it is a social media, but the adverse or the, uh, the, the, for, uh, the situation where the state went to the extreme force to deal with any protest, it start to get populated through the social media. When uh, 20 or 30 people are standing there in a protest for the uh, for uh, uh, Kivaya movement, you will find hundreds of soldiers around them. So by Khalid Said, which is perhaps a famous story, when his uh, skull was damaged, this, uh, it was actually a web, uh, for, uh, Facebook page was generated, attracted hundreds of thousands of people within a few days. But it was not until the images of the spatial actions start to change the state in a country where you have this kind of situation that nobody can really emerge to the public space and have a stand without having security, they, there are a kind of mobilization through the Facebook and social media where they manage a pattern, a special pattern based on our interviews to them, is really has been thought through for a long time. How to make an special movements and, and actions and display that really challenge the state without giving the chance for police forces to come and after you. This is a stand having silent stand, nobody talk to each other at special distance on 18 cities at the same, t at, the, at the time, with a kind of a huge test to the state's ability, which is in fact showed that the public movement and uprising is a possibility. Then this what takes build up to the next step, which is very briefly about what happens to the Square, its history, and it's uh, perhaps the Professor Sayed talked about, it's a more secular and, and historical center, but just skip its importance here, perhaps. And then here, I'm not talking about the, the politics behind it, but in fact, we are just documenting what has been there and trying to study it. So Tahrir Square is a place where it's really exposed to formal institutions, have a lot of hotels around it, so it's really facilitate a lot of picturing and control of what's happening. It's the most protected space for a long time by the state and its uh, apparatus. So by coming here, it was a very tough task for them, but at the same time will challenge severely the display of the image of the state as a stable state. So having Ramses Helton, there's Helton, Semiramis, three hotels where all the public media or the international media and journals, uh, journalists are replaced. You have the National Democratic Party and the Arab League and so on. And besides that, we have the, the Ministry of Interior. So the display of the space was substantial. And the discussion with them just you need really to get your place on, on the square. In order to gather, and this for this particular session, in order to gather narratives, it was a challenging point. How would you really come to objective outcomes of studying what has been happening? A lot of research has been done. A lot of discussion has been done on the political initiatives, or talking to politicians and talking to youth, uh, uh, youth activists. But for us, we tried to understand how every day worked, how the IT days came to existence and living and so on. So we had to go through two different things. First, just analyzing all the vast media of information that reports, live reports that were in there on time, on everyday basis. And this was trying to get the narratives, what happens when, in actually in real time, not really through communication with people. And we got to speak to uh, interview uh, around 55 interviews with different activists, doctors, everybody who was involved in there, even the occupiers of the apartments around the square to get to really to understand what has been happening here. Do does their accounts really match what has been recorded in time or not? We start to create, <coughs> sorry, narratives that day by day we start to record what has been happening. And this is just a kind of a very quick glimpse about the 21st of January, how people start to approach the square from its existence. Uh, it was under uh, direct uh, blockade by the security forces, which is really is, is, uh, is a red thing. All the red buildings are really formal uh, state institutions. Then they have really, they had to challenge the state at some points, and on the 28th of January, they start to make it their way to the, uh, the heart of the square. People, with people flooding into the square, just have certain moment in the afternoon of 28th where actually, <laughs> They claimed the right to the square. It becomes theirs, and all security forces withdrew. And then emerged the question. So we are there. So what? 
people who have not been in uprising before, there's no, it's a vital difficulty of managing the situation and so on. So what we need to do, there is a lot of things needs to happen. By this becoming an independent state at the time, and there has been hand, uh, tens of thousands of people uh, on today, and we need to really to manage how does this kind of activities work. So in order to do that, based in daily basis, we start to document where people were living, where the prayers had taken place, where the hospital, medical hospital started and emerged. And actually, when attacks came to the square, from which side and how did they pass? Then, then, and by 4th of February, when all the attacks passed through the squares and they had claimed the state, we start to study how this actually uh, comp complicated or complex kind of state, a square state phenomena came to exist. And how did they serve themselves? How did they get the food inside? How did they manage the prayers? And where the prayers are happening? And how the food went inside under the seat of the security force for several days? So we start to come to a sequential maps where it documents, sorry, what everything is happening. So with regard to strategy and, and defense and offense, there has been decisions about where every part of the, uh, of the entrance has to be secure. This brings back their practice. It's not a kind of emergent haphazard kind of experience, but they have done this already in their Hawaii's. And with the interviews of the lead activists of that stage, they said that when we came to the point that we have claimed the square, we really could not really know how to deal with it. And they have to rely from people from the Hawaii or from the peripheral areas to manage it, even to defend it and to challenge the security forces. And they have claimed that we, at certain point, at this moment, we have to step back and leave these people who have practice to control security and so on to take place. So in fact, that you will find that while the urban elite was leading the negotiations with the state and, and the political situation at that stage, it's actually the urban poor who are outside the spectrum of the state policies is actually, in, in fact, who are leading the protection of the square and the battles with the regime at that time. Part of it is actually is the, sub, is the conscious actions, momentary action on the time when they attack the leading headquarters, but in fact the fire that has placed from there, start to attack the, pole, the new neighboring building, which is part of their own uh, treasure, this is the Egyptian museum. And you can see here at the immediate moment that where this is under fire, the same people who have trended to assemble to protect the museum from theft. Again, it's a part of their protection if, if the normal people or the populace that understand what really values their own assets as individuals of a country, so they start to act immediately and if they want something offensive to them, they attack. We, part of our documentation is just to start to really map it day by day when every action has been happening, where the blockage is happening, and how this social phenomenon come to existence. And this is part of the maps that we have developed for, uh, for the uh, defense and offense. Where do they really defend the square and where they attack the police? and so on. Part of that is that, and this is actually where the politics are happening and where the area of negotiation. And the structures, again, this is not some, something that really uh, is the idea that where the ideas of the leading political activists. But in fact, this is the poor who have defended previously against the state assaults on there, in like in Baba, like uh, Kit Kat. This is an area that the state itself could not really get through for their immediate everyday business about tackling, a, 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 tackling a, a criminal or something. And in one of the interviews that I have conducted, they said that, in fact, when the state wanted to catch, capture a criminal in one of these areas, they have to negotiate with the local people. The local people are the only people who just really can drag any criminal outside. And the state cannot really approach this kind of contingent, uh, uh, so, or sorry, uh, challenging dense spaces. So. Here, one of the important things that perhaps the medical uh, serves on support that emerged. And this emerged based on, on, on uh, our records as a kind of colony kind of service of system. That at the start, when you have certain points of conflict, that there will be an immediate recovery and hospitalization. But when at certain moments within this 18 days, when there's a need for a kind of a bigger hospital, 
they start to have a, a center which is actually on the periphery of the street and have a certain points of, uh, uh, of hospitalization at the points of conflicts. And this created a service that if you compare it with any normal kind of urban uh, planning, so you will find you will be placing your system. The point here is that they, those people were not trained. These people were just a momentary action to start to place their own strategic points to support their cause for the conflict. Similar with the reason, with how to live in 18 days, and some of them had families and kids, and there emerged that there had been a nursery and education for children, and the food supply was coming through a secured kind of route, which is away from the offensive places. And you will find that the central spaces were mainly concentrated where uh, the ancient camps and this had been kind of swap of these actions. Five minutes. All right. Just, uh, I'm not taking not too long now. It's just a point here that, uh, again, just with regard to the rituals, and this is very important things about mobilization, about how to capture these kind of images. And we'll talk about the next few slides about the media, where the strategic places of the prayers have taken places why they are not in different places, and where the cameras were located at certain balconies. It's all, it has been a kind of a series of strategic decisions that really made clear that you need to mobilize people, and in order to mobilize people, you need to place your and cameras at the right moments, the right spots, capture the image in the same way, and start to display, make display like this is a symbolic uh, funeral for uh, murderers or uh, the victims in the few days. To manage their own local state, they start to create their own system of journalism. You have people of the urban poor, they cannot really purchase the journals, and they have got supplies and so on. So from one place to another, you start to come to this reality where in, in local neighborhoods, I look at Hawaii, you have people really sharing a lot of things. They really support each other. So you get few people who really afford to buy newspapers, they make an exhibition, I don't know if this image is really clear or not. Mm -hmm. and, and here, this kind of point about where the stage is happening and the cameras at the back buildings, which really has a secured background. And this is like area coverage of the image. So this is where most of the activities are happening. Interestingly, later on, when we have certain divisions between the Muslim brother of the Islamist kind of camps and the secular camps at the Battle of Cameras, and uh, uh, last summer about who have assembled more people. These have become to, uh, prominent things to influence political decisions and even in international foreign policy about which camp to, suppo uh, to support, who can assemble more protests, uh, uh, protests. And this is a very interesting point that this is really capturing an early investigation of what has happened uh, or, or actually the uh, in uh, July about the statements for the Muslim Brotherhood. Because in fact, it's just, this is another point about if this has been happening during the 2011, how about 2013? I'm looking at interesting, uh, a kind of objective point of view, we need, we need to, this is a kind of still early stage, we did not really develop much yet. But what's interesting here about one of the images that has been captured about the protection of that space, but we have, by search, we found the same picture at 70 different uh, media agencies at the same time, the same image exactly. So in fact, you will see the circulation of this kind of imagery and way that, the way that the image has been taken to be circulated in certain things, certain situations. Comparing this kind of spatial arrangements to what happened in Tahrir Square, this has its own problems which may be contributed to just the subsequent events. Part of it is just residential areas, not a state-run area. Residential area where the protest and sentence has to come to compromise the individual needs of people in surrounding buildings. So it's actually, it start to, to become conflict with the local support. So there was no local support and start to stop and things are happening. So people look, uh, who are living there, sorry, was not supportive at that stage. Similarly, the stage, center stage at the back of the quarter just really behind it to back it up was just really strategically taken and the media was circulated around in that area and most of action activities have been taking place in here. Sentence in the center was quite convenient but actually there's a problem with these kind of sentence around the houses that really prevent any access for, for local people. So in fact, just having a particular cause and the arrangement that really does not help to get the, uh, 
people align with you from the local areas that you are living in. And it's, it's perhaps it's a one strategic decision that to go in a place where it's just higher middle class, that they are not affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood or the Islamists at all. So it's effectively, you have decided to go in a sentence for an area that really has little sympathy to your cause and start to conflict them, which is really provide a lot of challenges. So, and a lot of uh, violence has occurred as well. But again, this I cannot really contribute a lot of finding towards this. But in general, just with regard to the general findings of this research that has developed so far, it's just it's really is about the public space, about how that space of the city just becomes start to attract or drag people to come out of their own neighborhoods or communities on the preferred regions to come and practice their own rights and uh, private even manage their own private lives within such massive public uh, uprising. So the public space capacity of contestation has certain requirements for accessibility, symbolism, and strategic location, coverage, and local support, which all contribute to its success. Urban elite who are leading the political discourses, but in fact, urban poor who just are really, who are leading this kind of uprising and making and facilitating it to happen. And perhaps this is part of what's happening in Egypt now, that you have the uprising, but you don't struggle to get a leadership really represents the whole interest of, of society. Uh, spatial practices here are dynamic and interchangeable in response to changing situations. This has been a part of the flexibility of their practice on daily basis on the 18, uh, in the 18th uh, days uh, stand, uh, sentence in Tahrir Square. But in fact, this might perhaps bring you back that here, part of it is just the overall structure of leadership and the hierarchical orders uh, from top down, which is everybody has to follow what has been said from the leaders, which was not the case in Tahrir Square. In general, just I'd like to summarize that inherent experiences in everyday lives here in Old Cairo in parts that we don't really see or study or understand in common research arena uh, actually uh, contribute to the effective reproduction of space. So the space that has been designed and con under control for many decades have been challenged and in fact reproduced by the urban poor that in a way that really facilitates the political cause. So we understand that this kind of practices that really could have been a lot of influence, uh, could have a lot of influence on our understanding to the way this kind of protests really have developed. And while we are, we could debate the political reason and cause and leadership and so on, there is a factual thing that there has been practices on the on the ground that really challenged a very a deeply rooted uh, regime. And uh, thank you. Okay, we come to our last speaker for this session, Tamaris Fakhoui. Dr. Fakhoui is an, as an assistant professor in political science and international relations uh, at the Lebanese American University in Beirut. Uh, she was the recipient of the Jean Monnet Fellowship in Comparative Politics at the European Union, uh, at the European University Institute in Florence and was also a visiting scholar here at the Center for Middle Eastern Studies a couple of years ago. She continues to be an active uh, lecturer in our Global Summer Program. Her research focuses on comparative democratization in the Arab world with an emphasis on divided societies and on the linkages between transnational uh, immigration and political change. Her paper today is titled Transnational Spaces of Liberation, uh, the case of Arab immigrant networks in the Occupy movement in the United States. Please welcome Tamar al um, Hello. Um, thank you for this opportunity. Um, so in this work in progress that I will present, um, I will explore the linkages between space and protest through the transnational immigrant lands. Um, I'm going to look at the main ways through which Arab communities engaged in the Occupy movement with a special emphasis on one protest site, the Occupy Oakland in the Bay Area, California, which started on October 10, 2011, but ended in clashes between the police and the protesters. Um, I will examine the ways Arab networks used spaces of insurgency in Occupy Oakland to voice the demands of the Arab uprisings, to juxtapose the Occupy movements and Arab uprisings grievances, 
And I'm going to show how Occupy Oakland can be analyzed as a transnational political field and look at the implications of such an analytical framework. Um, I chose Occupy Oakland as an exploratory and revelatory case study for studying protest and public space for the following reasons. Research in the last two decades has focused on global and paradigmatic cities such as Los Angeles, Paris, Ber Berlin, for studying the linkages between locality and migration. Other cities that were defined as non-global were tackled through a nation state container prism. There is a call to extricate the studies on migration and space from global cities literature. Oakland is interesting for exploring the link between protest and immigrant engagement and for developing a conceptual framework for urban locality and migration because I contend that it is a non-paradigmatic city. It gives insights into how locality can be nested in globality. Further, the diverse sociopolitical fabric in Oakland and occupies protest dynamics allowed for a more pronounced engagement in Arab political issues. This was not necessarily the case in other um, Occupy, uh, in the Occupy Wall Street or other counterparts which attempted to focus on economic issues. Occupy Oakland is used actually as an example to refer to Occupy sites where there is the most inequality within the 90, 90% and where communities of color got engaged despite the general consensus in scholarship that ethnic communities were not visible in the Occupy movement as a whole. It's important to note here that the city of Oakland has historically had a very problematic uh, relationship with its police forces. So police brutality has been reported to be excessive in Occupy Oakland. This dialectical field of uh, resistance and repression within protest dynamics in, was conducive to striking more comparative linkages with the Arab uprisings, and hence the interestingness of this case study. Uh, what are the research components I'll be briefly going over in my presentation? So I'm going to analyze the transnational repertoires of contention that Arab communities drew on in the Occupy uh, Oakland spatial field. I will show how they attempted to carve out their own spaces of insurgency, and I'm going to study how they amplified their action repertoires beyond the physical periphery of the Occupy Oakland by establishing linkages with the Occupy Wall Street in New York and the Arab world. I further show that while Occupy Oakland can be very much analyzed as an opportunity for approximating struggles, it has also led to fracture and dissonance. At the heart of this observation lies the necessity to examine public space as empowering and disempowering. Uh, of course, my bro let me explain why this interest in this area of inquiry. So my broad area of inquiry is rooted in the protest diffusion wave that spread to over 100 countries since 2011. An arising question to political scientists is whether this wave offers a new empirical terrain for studying how transnational non-state actors, such as immigrant communities, renegotiate the politics of space beyond territoriality. Um, how can we conceptualize migration, place, and protest? And what can the concept of transnational immigration add to our study uh, of the politics of space? The intersection of politics and space uh, has been mostly explored, as I said earlier, through the prism of the nation state con uh, container, or what we call methodological nationalism. Still, in the last two decades, there has been an increasing focus on how immigrant populations ground transnational political practices in localities, yet decouple them from the nation state prism. In a nutshell, there is growing interest in the unbounded geographies that immigrant populations negotiate. Still, the linkages between such transnational geographies and protest sites have not been sufficiently explored. I'm interested in looking at how immigrant networks shape what we call transnationalism from below and reshape the relationships between politics and space. How is that relevant for the Occupy movement? So I contend in my paper that the recent protest diffusion wave and the interconnectedness in protest frames across regional clusters offers an insightful avenue to exploring such unbounded geographies and how they refract through the prism of locality. Um, so as we all know, the Occupy movement was influenced by various protest movements and the Arab uprisings were considered to be a main source of inspiration when it comes not only uh, to the methods of protest but also rhetoric and imagery. 
A body of studies has dedicated excessive attention to framing how digital linkages brought these two protest movements together. So focus was rather placed on the virtual dimension of transnationalism, the physical presence and actions of Arab communities in more than 1,000 occupy sites in the US has, has only sparked uh, superficial interest. Uh, the study of Arab communities in the Occupy movement could have yet many suggestive implications. One of these implications, it helps gain a concrete understanding of how transnational activism is grounded not only in the digital sphere of contention, but also in the physical. Um, there is a lack of statistical data when it comes to quantifying Arabs' presence during the Arab movement. Uh, the, uh, the Occupy movement, uh, excuse me. Further, we know for a fact that ethnic communities were not very visible in the Occupy movement. Still, my research shows so far that Arabs capitalized on the Occupy movement to establish transnational political fields of solidarity and dissent. The significance of such a movement is not to be measured against a statistical, uh, but rather a symbolic backdrop. Uh, factors that might have given uh, impetus to these networks are the timely convergence between both protests and the resemblance in protest tactics and themes. A few words on my methodology. So I have drawn on a qualitative research design. I carried out between summer 2012 and summer 2013 semi-structured interviews with key Arab, Arab American, and also American activists and organizations who were main players in the Occupy Oakland field. I analyzed their communicative statements, digital and printed. My interview design aimed at detecting whether Arab communities linked up and reproduced issues of cont contestation across protest sites through the use of argumentative discourses, common semantics, and protest actions. I also aimed to understand the rifts and the visions they dealt with. So I used two layers of analysis uh, really for uh, decoding the intersectionality between political engagement and spatial di dynamics, the local prism, how they downscale transnational contention in the micro dynamics of locality, and the transnational prism, how they use glo locality to go global. Uh, while I'm still collecting data, I have so far had the possibility to throw into light the most visible Arab activist networks in the Occupy Oakland. It's very important to highlight that Arab presence was very fluid, irregular, and of a non-formalized nature. Their participation in Occupy Oakland ranged from partic participating in demonstrations, prefigurative politics, taking part in various committees, to negotiating the occupation of the physical space through encampments. They also interacted with several transnational groups and tents. Still, there was soon the realization that Arab mobilization needed a spatial grounding in the physical and central arena of Occupy Oakland to be significant. Uh, so the Intifada tent was created as the main platform for Arab mobilization. It carved out a physical presence in the time span ranging from October 2011 until January 2012, which is considered to be the prime of Occupy Oakland. The tent's objectives were to build community share information about Arab uh, issues, and show joint struggle of Arabs with the other communities. There was also the realization that occupying a visible physical space is going to bring about media visibility. Uh, so in uh, the Intifada tent soon became the Intifada commune and occupied a larger space as other tents joined. Of course, it had to have a digital presence. Uh, so. How to analyze Arab communities' involvement? What were their discourses and strategic actions? My analysis shows so far that Arab activists, whether in the Intifada tent or in other networks, uh, attempted to replicate the demands of the Arab uprisings in the US, raise awareness about the mutually reinforcing grievances in the US protests and those in the Arab region, and delegitimize certain power structures and political practices, and most importantly, expand the discourse of Occupy beyond domestic capitalism by linking it to war, imperialism, and military aid. I'm going to provide <coughs> an abbreviated account of their tactical repertoires and show how they try to bridge and unite frames across both protest movements. It's worth noting, and it's very interesting to see how uh, the repertoires really relied on constructing argumentative and connective frames that would make their discourses and plight relevant to and aligned with surrounding and international audiences. 
One primary goal was to reproduce the demands of the Arab uprisings in the U.S. so as to seek to affect change from here. So their strategy was to infuse Arab issues onto Occupy and to recontextualize the Arab demands in the Auckland setting by building across uh, protest sites discursive links of interdependence, resemblance, and parallelism. A main argument revolved around evidencing that the imperfections of capitalism and liberal democracy in the U.S. cannot be dissociated from authoritarianism and oppressive legacies in the Middle East and North African region. The crucial argumentative link lies hence in connecting U.S. domestic politics to its uh, policies in the Arab region. For instance, arguing very concretely that austerity measures and cuts in education and uh, public services in the domestic U.S. scene took place despite funding wars in the Middle East and providing military aid to Arab autocracies. Another strategy was to build by way of discourses and direct actions links of resemblance between what is happening in Occupy Auckland and in the Arab world. The Palestinian issue, which evokes the shared theme of occupation, was recurrently drawn upon so as to evidence the similarities between what is happening in the camps in Palestine on the one hand and in Occupy Auckland on the other. Direct actions in Auckland, for instance, established similarities between Palestinian hunger strikes and the Occupy for prisoners in Auckland. Uh, moreover, the autocratic legacies in the Arab world were connected to police brutality and the use of tear gas in the Occupy site, which was really a leitmotif. Um, the rationale for constructing such links of resemblance, according to my key informants, was to create relationships of solidarity across regions, demonstrating that struggles were similar and denouncing occupation and repression as, de as delocalized practices. Although all of my key informants agree at the end of the day that the comparative link is exaggerated, they note that the relevance of such transnational comparison lies in the cognitive dimensionality. Uh, these are some uh, pictures representing banners, flyers, marches, or protests that are illustrative of the co connective links between Occupy and the Arab uprisings with primary reference to Tahrir Square. I'm going to scroll down very quickly I would like to thank here Lara Bitar and other uh, activists in Occupy who have kindly provided me with the documentation. Uh, these messages and frames give grounded insight into what I call transnational placemaking, and Arab activists were really the curators of such connective frames. These are some of the circulated texts that are evocative of the transnational language of insurgency that linked up protest sites. It's very interesting to study them and to see how they attempted to bridge and diffuse master frames in the social movement uh, literature. Um, In addition to voicing the demands of the Arab uprisings, Arab activists addressed as well grievances that Arab communities in the U.S. are grappling with since 9-11. To make these grievances more accessible to the Oakland communities, they built as well links of interdependence and resemblance. For, for instance, they connected Arab immigrants' pro pro problems in the U.S. with the theme of militarization in the Egypt. Or, for example, they made a parallels between the theme of Arab dignity in the U.S and in Syria. Um, beyond these solidarity linkages, um, my research so far shows that Arabs used peripheral sites in Occupy Oakland, those that are not visible in the media, not necessarily central squares or plazas, but rather committees and less parallel, uh, visible parallel sites to discuss their storylines and reflect on how they can better organize and connect with other communities. One core issue of discussion was what my, one of my informant calls practical internationalism, or how to build concrete links between their actions here in the homeland and in the hostland. Which local policies should one uh, really focus on? An additional dimension to Arab uh, community organizing in Occupy Oakland is the translocal and transnational one. I'm talking here about the scale shift in contention, i.e. how they try to establish uh, ties and exchange tactical repertoires with other Occupy sites in the U.S. and with the Arab homeland. 
I'm currently studying how the Intifada tent and the Global Justice Group in Occupy Wall Street cooperated during that period and emulated each other's repertoires of contention. Such exchanges have in fact inspired some activists in New York to carve out a more central space for Arab activism within the Occupy Wall Street, uh, which as we know was more focused on economical dynamics. Main prog programs they focused on was the tear gas <laughs> campaign in Bahrain and in Egypt. Um, on a broader scale, there is evidence of transnational exchanges during October 2011 and May 2012 between Tahrir, Tahrir Square and Occupy Oakland, episodic physical visits, but also digital fields, uh, fields of action. Um, some activists from Oakland still seek to curate such digital linkages through Facebook pages. The Facebook page, Oakland and Cairo and One Fist, is a case in a point. Um, so while Occupy Oakland can be easily analyzed as a transnational space of liberation, it has also given ways to spaces of exclusion, friction, and dissonance. It's worth emphasizing that the impact of Arab immigrant networks in general was very limited. It's more, its importance lies in its symbolic dimension, really. So after the second poli, uh, police raid of the Occupy Oakland camp, Arabs was di were discouraged and started dropping out. Also, political strategizing was weak, incoherent, and meso-level networking remained still very informal. Uh, there were not only divergences between Arab communities and the main Occupy Oakland, but also within Arab communities and people of color communities. The most important rifts are the terminology of occupation. There were serious divergences whether the protest movement should be called decolonize Oakland or decolonize um, or occupy Oakland. At some point, there was a parallel decolonize Oakland movement. Um, also, Despite the horizontal and leaderless dimension that the Occupy movement was known for, my research shows that there were invisible power struggles, such as who is going to set the agenda, who is going to speak at the protest, who is going to blow the horn. The theme of unequal access to the main field of power was very much emphasized. An additional rift that we can see more in localities or in smaller localities was the nature of protest tactics that were going to be used. There were gaps between dissenters who wanted to take protests to a higher level and others who questioned such tactics. Here we have to take into account the illegality of the Occupy protest and what it means for some vulnerable communities. Some of my informants reported that since Arabs were more vulnerable, they dreaded an escalation of confrontation tactics. There were also a lot of discussions on whether undocumented people should take place in direct action or not, and this is very important. Further, there were too many, uh, two main conflicting repertoires of action at the heart of the Arab community as a whole. Was it more effective to seize the moment and stage, stage direct and solidarity action, or is this really meaningless? Should we concentrate on base building through community organizing and coalition building? And all this took uh, place uh, behind uh, <coughs> uh, in, in, uh, in invisible sites. So some of my key informants were further keen on telling me about the various fragmented and parallel sites of the Occupy Oakland that emerged within and in parallel to the main Occupy Oakland that was advertised in the media or um, on Facebook or in Twitter. So should we then concentrate in our study on studying visible protest sites or the invisible ones, those that were not taken into account by the media? For example, Occupy East Oakland. She doesn't have many likes on Facebook. So I come now to my concluding remarks. <coughs> While I have no intent really to generalize findings about the Occupy movement in general, my exploratory research so far shows that Arab networks used Occupy Oakland as a discursive space for transnationalizing claims-making activities and shaping physical and cognitive domains of encounter. As a political opportunity platform for Arab diasporic action and for more involvement in US immigration and foreign politics. My most significant finding is that Occupy Oakland provided a transnational public sphere and here I'm, I'm quoting Nancy Fraser, for storytelling in which narratives were exchanged. Some of my key informants stressed the importance of the post-Occupy legacy rather than the Occupy Oakland legacy. Uh, they say that, these ha that the post-Occupy legacy has brought some movements together and gave new impetus to Arab organizing in the Bay Area. Although the physical protest site is no longer here, 
Various projects emanated from the 2011 juncture, for instance, a seized, a seized space that was transformed to a library in East Auckland. Um, another central finding is that looking at the main plazas and encampments is not sufficient to understand the ways Arab communities navigated the possibilities for a political action. Discussions of what occupy Oakland for ethnic communities should stand for were negotiated in various other peripheral uh, or discrete place, uh, spaces. As Jeffrey Juris argues, due to the eviction of camps, communities shifted towards forms of networking and organizing in less publicly visible places. How can we build on these findings to generate some insights at the boundary of uh, migration, urban, and protest studies? So very quickly, global cities literature tackling migration um, has mostly concentrating on framing immigrant communities in the last two decades in urban rescaling as labor. The increasingly transnational nature of protests for me is fascinating because it offers an analytical entry point for approaching the relationship between migration space and politics and for identifying how these stakeholders negotiate ownership of the politics of space. Of course, one cannot explore such a, th such a theme without factoring in national public discussions about immigration in the US, the policing of national borders and the implications of such discussions on social inclusion. Despite the horizontal nature of Occupy Oakland, these contentious debates, debates reflected an agenda setting in the organization of protests. Some communities debated whether they had to ask for a permit, a permit to demonstrate as they feared being targeted. So transnational protests are interesting junctures whereby one could uh, more closely observe categories of belonging in localities. And the relationship between public squares, visibility, and illegality in the Occupy movement could be taken as a field study to convey various insights regarding immigrant incorporation and the variation in spatial segregation, i.e., which populations chose central spaces to protest, which communities drew on peripheral uh, sites in Occupy uh, Oakland or in the Occupy movement in general. Moreover, immigrant communities' engagement in protest sites can be viewed as a key indicator of how cities position themselves within global fields of power. Do they position themselves as spaces of exclusion or spaces of inclusion? Emerging questions that I would like to ask, and maybe we could discuss this later on. How can scholars of urban restructuring incorporate immigrants in their studies as urban scale makers? Can the study of protests help us here? And what do protests tell about the uneven right um, to the politics of space? And against this backdrop, maybe a very important policy uh, issue, how to engage immigrant populations as local stakeholders at a very micro uh, level in policy discussions on transnational geog the geography of citizenship and how it reflects really in mini spaces or mini societies. There is obviously a call to work here across disciplines. So engaging into these discussions that are at the boundary of migration, urban, and protest studies could open up new perspectives for studying, for developing public space, urban policy, and the politics of inclusion. Thank you. Yes. <coughs> Thank you. I mean, I think there is a difference between any procession which is an expression of cultural identity in a context in which, you know, the audience for it is willing to accept it as an expression of that diversity. But if you take, say, something like a Ku Klux Klan parade that marches through an area mainly African-American, is that a parade that is there to represent some kind of cultural expression or is it a parade to represent some degree of domination and, and so on? So what we know is that parades can take these different forms. Now, back in Northern Ireland, there has been a practice of parades that have been used as expressions of domination. And therefore, um, they are interpreted by the, the people who are on the receiving end of that message, you know, as something that is triumphalist, as something which is a coat trailing and, and, and something that is, if you like, an expression of their um, subjugation, basically. Now, it's a difficult issue because 
those people that are marching in those parades that you saw during the summertime, if you followed it, would say, we've always been doing this, going back decades, going back even hundreds of years. We have a tradition, we have a cultural tradition of doing this. And surely as citizens, we have a right in the city to march where we want as an expression of that. But what has happened in the city during the conflict is that there has been a spatial demographic shift so that areas that once were largely Protestant, for example, are now largely Catholic. And those Catholic areas are saying, whereas you used to march here when the area was largely of your persuasion, now you're marching here in a different context. And you're marching, if you like, as an expression against our interest. And we see that as an intrusion into our area in, in that way. So it's, ca it's caught up in all of that history and all of that political conflict. And um, the question I was trying to pose was, in that circumstance, is it preferable to say in a city that is so deeply divided that nobody should be able to say, this is my area and you can't march through here? Um, but does it also mean that those who are marching, if they do have the freedom of the city, that they also have a responsibility in the march to have a march that does not have an expression of triumphalism or political domination or whatever, you know? That's the difficult question. Yes. Um, so I just want to say something about the yeah. violence in Occupy Ukraine. Yes. So um, as I have done like nearly 20 or 30 interviews, there were contradictory versions, those who wanted to highlight actually police brutality, and those who highlighted, for example, what you said, the provocateurs mm -hmm. or the unknown elements. Uh, so there, there are contradictory versions in the storytelling and what really led to the escalation of these protest repertoires in Occupy Oakland. And I tried to take into consideration uh, both sides uh, in order to incorporate or to create, uh, um, let's say, a more objective picture of what was happening. What is mostly important to my analysis is that what happened created a dialectical field of resistance and oppression, mm -hmm. which actually um, escalated the whole thing to a higher level and uh, did not discourage some protesters, but led them you know, to actually meeting in peripheral spaces or seeing how they can strategize in the longer run. However, you are very right when you say that this has disempowered and really paralyzed the movement, and it has led to creating also a very strong and stark fractures among uh, people because they were doubtful of each other's agenda. Even with the committee started, for example, fragmenting, uh, and then uh, uh, offshoot committees started started taking place. So it's very interesting to see how this does not only happen in you know visible protest sites, but everything that was happening, what was lurking beneath, fragmentation was also taking place. So violence had, as you said, uh, major implications on the fractures and the rifts um, that happened. Yet some of my optimistic uh, key informants say that we have really to look at the post-Occupy legacy and how you know, narratives have taken place, friendships have taken place, and this, for example, could have more constructive ramifications in the longer uh, term. This is why I talked about the transnational public sphere. Um, I tried to look beyond violence and protest actions in order to see how storytelling, narrative subjectivities were interwoven in order to create some new um, cognitive or physical domains of encounter. Okay. Yeah, I think this is a critical issue because I think the nature of violence itself changes the circumstance of these things completely. Um, it's where you do replace the force of argument with the argument of force. And I think violence in these circumstances is inherently authoritarian. Um, it's not democratic. And quite often, the people that suffer most in these circumstances are the poorest and most marginalized populations, where a lot of the conflict and so on is, is uh, concentrated. And there's no question that in many of these conflicts, there will be certain protagonists who deliberately use violence as a way of provoking more state repression, that they hope then that state repression provokes resistance and mobilizes mass populations. Um, so I think we can't be blind to, to all of that. On the other hand, um, you know, do we live in a completely pacifist world? Is that feasible? Is there something to the Christian theologies about just wars? 
Um, if you remember, there are five precepts or principles behind the Thomas Aquinas kind of Christian principles of a just war, that there, all alternatives have been tried and have offered nothing, that if the violence is used, that it is proportionate to the injustice addressed, that it has a realistic chance of actually prevailing and winning and achieving something better, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, the, there are these kind of principles that I think can be measured against some of this. But I agree with you in general that in any of these circumstances where violence emerges, it's often at the cost of a better, more productive, progressive way forward. Yeah, I think that's you know, the kind of central difficult issue in these circumstances. Where is that big bang moment that can mobilize a different kind of politics? You know, the kind that I'm talking about, the agonistic politics I'm talking about. Um, now, what I've discovered in, in groups that I've worked with is that your best chance of, of getting some initiation of that and some development of that is around those who believe in a progressive kind of politics. That is, that they believe in certain core values, civic values, around equality and justice and so on, however difficult some of these concepts are. Um, and I think that, you know, where you get any elements, I mean, we, we tend to think of the state as some kind of homogeneous, monolithic structure. But I think if you get the beginnings of some of that progressive politics, you'll find that there are elements of the state often that can be tapped into. So I think it's a very differentiated process. It's not a simple thing of designating certain groups as the vanguard movement. I mean, I think there's always difficulties with vanguard movements anyway, that they think they have all the answer and they end up being authoritarian themselves in the delivery of that answer. So I think it is trying to identify principles and values and how can you mobilize the best coalitions around those values. Um, can I jump on this, Frank? 